Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Marinda Bueta. Um, you were here yesterday, so you heard Billy talking about nerds and geeks and dorks. Okay, so I really, when he said that, I'm like, I really don't know where I fit in between those three. But what I do know is my whole life, I've been passionate and fascinated about non-verbal communication. I love watching people and looking at tiny little uh, gestures they do that reveal who they are. I love it. My, my life is non-verbal communication. So I went and studied, um, I'm a professional actor and a voiceover artist and I trained in London, I trained to be a clown and mime and in physical theatre. So these are all art forms where you use non-verbal communication as a means of expressing uh, your, your, or bring meaning and uh, bring out emotion. Um, I'm also a lecturer in a tertiary education institution, I'm a, a working at a film school and I've also got online courses available in voiceovers, in how to perform on camera and create video tutorials and doing warm-ups to warm up your voice and your body. But for NerdCon, because we're not selling anything here today, um, I thought I'd talk about non-verbal communication in virtual environments. Because that is what VR is about and all the technology is moving towards creating virtual characters that we need to interact with. And non-verbal communication is extremely important for us to have empathy with them, to believe in them, to connect with them, and for them to be created in a believable way. They need to move like a human being, otherwise we don't want to listen to them. Okay. So, what is nonverbal communication? Nonverbal communication is all the actions surrounding communication, excluding speech. I'm just going to stop for a moment. This is my colleague, Vanner. He works with me, and he's going to be my guinea pig in a moment. Um, so, nonverbal communication includes our body language, our body movement, gesture, facial expression, and the movement of the eyes. It includes smells. Um, there's a, a way of communicating and tactile interaction. We can send really strong messages if we touch someone. You could strong, uh, send a really strong message that way. Um, it's also vocalics, the way we talk. Not necessarily what we are saying, but how we say it. The pitch, tone, speed at which we talk, um, the volume that we speak at, how clearly we speak. All of that is part of nonverbal communication. So. I want to use Werner as my guinea pig and demonstrate nonverbal communication for you with theatre masks. So I'm going to ask Werner to pick one of these masks. I use them in my workshops. Um, he's going to pick one and then I'm going to ask him to come and sit on this stool and do nothing. You as an audience, audience must please look at him. Look him up and down. So the moment he now puts on a mask, he's no longer Werner. He's now a persona. The moment you put on a mask, you become someone else. Okay, so I want you guys, please look this person up and down and then give me one word to describe his character, his personality, his emotional state, whatever. Give me one word to describe this character. But take a moment, look him up and down. Alert. Alert. He's quite alert. Tense. Tense. He's alert. He's tense. Anxious. Anything else? It's good. At, hmm? Strong. Strong. Yeah. I see you looking at his feet. It's good. You're looking. You're taking all of him. Um, okay. I'm going to give you a little bit more information about this character. I'm going to say this is Frank. Frank is an alcoholic. He drank before he came to work. Then got into his car and is also hiding some some drink behind his suitcase uh, or his briefcase. Um, can you please give me a, a few more descriptive words to describe his personality? Anxious. Still anxious. What else? Look him up and down. Nervous. Nervous. What else? Drunk. <laughs> He's drunk. Okay, Vanna, you can take off the mask. Thank you very much. Can I have the mask? Thank you. Thank you. Um, can, Vanna is not an alcoholic. He's a lovely guy. You can ask him anything. Um, can anyone else, would anyone else like to put on this mask? All I'm, gonna, I'm not going to call you an alcoholic, I promise. I just want you to sit on the stool and do nothing. But I want you to use this exact mask. Would someone like to come up? Would you? Thank you. Come and have a seat. Okay, I know it's hot, so I won't keep you here long. So put on the mask and just sit there for me. Thank you. Okay, now again, we have a new character, a new persona. Um, if you know this guy, I don't want you to answer. Um, Look at this character, this new personality in front of us. Give me one word to describe his character. Huh? 
How can you describe? Hmm? It looks healthy. Healthy. It looks healthy. Composed. Relaxed. Mellow. Anything else? Okay, thank you. You take off the mask. Excellent. Thank you. That's hard. Okay, so same mask, two individuals. We had tense. Uh, we have relaxed. Two very different descriptions, but it's the same mask. This thing is a dead thing. It has one expression. Why the different descriptions? Body language. Two very different body types here. Um, I purposefully ask them to do as little as possible and still you get such different descriptions for this personality. It's non-verbal communication. Imagine what we could do if I actually asked them to actually infuse your body with a character, create a character with your non-verbal communication. We have so much to work with. And you also, you have so much that you give away, even if you do so very little. It's in our it's presentation skills. It's if you have to uh, present in front of um, an audience or you have a meeting of any kind or you're on camera, you give away so much information before you even started talking. The moment you come into the room, we judge. It's a, it's a human quality. We judge people. The moment you come in, I decide I don't like the look of you. I'm just not going to listen to you. Or I immediately think, and you, you could be talking nonsense, but I'm like, I like the look of you. I like the way you stand. I'm going to listen. Nonverbal communication is super important. Okay, I want to move on to embodiment in virtuality, virtual reality, and um, augmented reality. So there's all these terms, like what do they mean? Okay, embodiment in virtuality looks at how we can use computer technology to be integrated as seamlessly as possible into our normal world, so into our real world. So that is your mobile phone. It is the ATM you use. It's the e-tall gantries. It's the internet of things, embedding microprocessors into everyday things. It is ubiquitous uh, computing. It is wearable technology, those smart watches and, and smart jewelry now, smart clothing, it's crazy. It's trying to get computers to be integrated into our normal lives as seamlessly as possible. Virtual reality, which you've seen at the, the other stands, is the complete opposite. It's trying to take a human and immerse us in a virtual world as successfully as possible. Augmented reality is trying to combine those two. The goal is to create an uh, immersive experience, taking virtual objects and making it an augmented, a supplemented experience with your real world um, experience. That's the difference between the three. Let me just check my notes. Okay, I want to focus on embodiment in virtual reality and virtual worlds. I'm also going to look at kinesthetics and empathy. Um, that's a way of connecting with those virtual characters. Because I believe, if we, to bring it back to e-learning, that a student commits so much more to the learning process. It's not just our literal minds, cognitive minds, that we use in learning. It can be a full body experience. So for e-learning designers, content creators, we need to understand nonverbal communication and come back to it to make better products and more immersive experiences. Okay, the next thing. Okay, so I brought these two objects to NerdCon. The first one is a, a hand carved wooden marionette, the other one is a robot, a child's toy. So I want to use them as metaphors. I want you to imagine that your end user, your student, your client is the puppet and your product or your e-learning course is the robot. What stands between them? It's a human being, it's you. You, the content developer, the designer, the marketer, whatever. We are human beings and the end user, even though I say it's a puppet, but you know what your target market is and you know it's a human being. You are talking to a human being. So it's coming back to I'm a human being communicating through a digital medium with another human being coming back to we all share the same qualities, the ways of expressing ourselves, non-verbal communication, the way we communicate is becoming super important. All of technology is advancing and advancing but becoming straight back to can you connect with that person? Can it make sense? Okay, I want to look at virtual reality and virtual worlds. What's the difference? You'll see now in the other stands, virtual reality is usually an individual and you have a head-mounted display that creates a virtual world for you with a virtual body that is um, 
overlapping with your physical body. So you have a duality of experience. Virtual worlds, you use avatars and your mouse and keyboard, and it's more about your user's um, imagination, his ability to imagine himself as a first person and a third person perspective. So it's about perspective, point of view. I can go there or I can see it from this side. Virtual reality research is one individual at a time and virtual world research is going to be hundreds of people because they are av avatars and it's forever changing in that world. Okay, makes sense. So for me, to look at embodiment, embodiment in virtual worlds and virtual reality, what is embodiment? It is the conscious awareness of our bodies in a space and how we experience the world through our bodies. It's also the unconscious or automatic response of our bodies to the world. So now how do us non-scientific, non-techie people experiment and become more aware of embodiment? And that is where I come in. So you're at NerdCon, I'm going to ask you to do a few very simple exercises with me. It's not difficult. First off, I'd like you to please stand up for me. We're just going to focus on our feet. Okay. I'm happy to see... Yeah, you're fine still. So people were here with like super high heels. I'm like, ladies, take off your shoes if you want because it's just better, but that's all right. Okay, so I want you to, to put your weight on the balls of your feet. Just ever so slightly, don't fall forward. I can then put the weight on the balls of your feet, on your, oh, on your heels. Sorry, put the weight on your heels and then put it to the side, to one side and then to the other side. Okay, now play around with it. Shift that weight and distribute your weight however you want. Now what I want to do with this is just to remind you, our feet are fantastic. I have really broad feet, so I feel really firmly planted on this floor. But it is our connection to the earth. It is also um, proof that gravity wins with every step you take. But it's also, it's a thing that's keeping you up, where you, you're, it's the, we start with our body alignment at our feet, at how you stand, and that affects everything about your alignment. So it's also about winning against gravity, we're standing up with every step. Okay, the next thing, I want you to massage your jaw. We carry so much tension in our jaw and in our tongue. Just for a moment, just become aware of that tension. And throughout NerdCon, you can stop if you want, it's quite sore sometimes. But throughout NerdCon, as you're listening to other um, people talking, just focus on that space and tell yourself, relax, release, release that jaw. Okay, last thing we're going to do is standing up. Not that we're going to lie down, but we're going to sit again. I want you to hug yourself. And what we're doing is we're trying to restrict the breathing here across our chest. And you're going to breathe in for me. Take a nice deep breath in. And can you feel how much of your back is opening up? Okay, do that for me again. Breathe in again. And just feel how much of your, the shoulder blades are pushing open because it needs to make space for the lungs to expand. That is amazing, the amount that uh, our backs can open up, if you call it that. You can have a seat again. Okay. We need air, we need to breathe properly, and that thing about air is energy, it's, it's true. The better you can breathe, the more energy you have, and the better you can deal with all of life's challenges. Okay, I want to do another little breathing exercise. If you can imagine, you know, you know if you take a brown paper bag, you make a hole and you go, and it pushes out, the air pushes out the back like that. I want you to imagine you've got a brown paper bag in your, in your chest. That's your lungs, the size of your lungs. Make it even bigger, make it here at your belly button. So as you breathe in, I want you to imagine you're going to push out the bottom of that bag first and then the sides. And if you have air left over, most people don't, you can take the top of that bag also to open it up. So as you're sitting there now, just breathe in for me and push out the bottom of that bag first and then the sides, and if you can, the top, and as you exhale, I want you to imagine you're taking that back and you're scrunching it up like that and all the air was going out. Okay, let's do it again. Breathe in, bottom of that back, sides of that back, maybe a little bit on the top, and on the out, everything out. Good. Once more, let's breathe in. Right. Up. And out. Okay, good. Okay, we're talking about embodiment. Embodiment is about experiencing the world through your body. It's about the senses. I want us to experience NerdCon for a moment, and I'm gonna take away the sense of sight, okay? So if you don't mind, close your eyes. If you do mind, just look at me, but focus on your ears, focus on what you can hear. You are at NerdCon. 
What are you hearing? I can hear other vendors talking, I can hear footsteps, I can hear the air conditioning, I can hear a little bit of crockery at the back, preparing lunch maybe. What else can you hear? Let's go to touch. The part of your body that is exposed to the air. How does the air feel? You were here yesterday, today it feels a little bit better, I think. How warm is the air? And what does the air feel like? Every space, if you go travel, for me always, when I get off the plane, the first thing I notice is the air on my skin, on my face. I'm like, oh, this air is different. What does the air feel like, apart from the temperature? It's part of NerdCon. Okay, taste. I don't think we haven't had, well, you might have had breakfast, maybe had a coffee or a cigarette. That's part of your experience of NerdCon. Yes? Senses. If we can incorporate all of these senses in our immersive worlds, we will be able to have a really successful experience for ourselves and our learners. Okay. I want to take this further. I want to do a short visualization exercise with you where we are all on the beach. Not all of us, you, just you, on the beach. Okay, and so for this I want you to close your eyes. So for a moment, imagine you are walking on your favorite beach. You're on the beach. You can decide, are you walking in the warm, dry <laughs> sand? Or are you walking in the wet sand and the waves is crashing over your feet? It's up to you. But you're walking at the beach and it's a beautiful day. I want you to really focus on seeing the waves. What are the color of the ocean? What is the color of the sand? What's, what's the color of the, the sky? Really see it. And can you feel as you're walking either, either the dry sand and the temperature of that sand or if you're in the wet sand can you, can you feel the muddiness through your feet if you're barefoot, if you're not in your, in your favorite shoes? How much are you sinking into the sand? Really feel it. Or what can you hear? Is there a breeze? Can you hear the breeze? Can you hear the waves crashing? Are there children playing around you? What can you smell? Is there a very strong oceany uh, smell? Can you smell donuts or, or ice cream? Or is it a very clean nature smell? Try and capture that moment as strongly as possible with all of your senses. Okay, open your eyes for me. Right, so we all have one sense that's stronger than the others. For most people, it's sight, but not for everyone. So answer for yourself, what was your strongest sense? Could you really see the color of the ocean, color of the sand, or was it more for you about feeling it, that you could feel um, the sand as you're walking? Or could you feel the breeze on your skin? Or was it about the sound? Your sense that's stronger than anything else. Have a think. So I want to give you a job. Let's say you now have to create a virtual world, an alien world. It has to be a beach. So can you change your experience you just had, use that one strong sense of yours, and use that as your starting point to change the, the scene? So let's say if sight was your strongest sense, then maybe you want to change that world and make the ocean green and the sand purple and the sky orange. I don't know. Okay, so if, if, if your strong sense was sound, to add lightning that's crashing and lots of, lots of uh, harsh noise, a very harsh environment. So in your mind's eye, change the world into an alien world using your strongest sense. Have a think. Okay, this level of immersion is what we are aiming for, I think, and for the future. If we could achieve this level of immersion with our senses, we, we have done quite a lot. I want to move on to kinesthetic empathy. Kinesthetic empathy is the ability to express empathy merely by observing the motions of other people. It's the ability to simulate internal uh, movement sensations by watching someone else do something. Simplest example of that is if you see someone trip and fall and you go, oh, that must have hurt. That's empathy. That's kinesthetic empathy. Okay. We use kinesthetic empathy to explain why people connect to an avatar, to a virtual thing in the first place. We identify with it. We have empathy for it. But we can only have empathy for it if it moves in a way that we can connect with, that we think is believable. We also have kinesthetic learning, um, where students prefer to interact with tactile objects and have um, 
exercises instead of just sitting there listening to a lecture or watching a lecture. So it brings me to what was said earlier, that different students have different learning styles, just as we as individuals have different ways of expressing ourselves, different way of teaching and different way of learning. The key is to always stay connected with your audience. Okay. So I quickly want to show you an extract from one of my lessons from my course, how to create video tutorials and perform on camera. And this one is about connecting with your audience. Hello and welcome to our lesson on how to connect with your audience. So you have to record talking head videos and you definitely want to keep your viewers engaged and listening to what you are saying. How do you do that? First of all, remember that you are a professional in your field. You know what you are talking about. Find your passion in the content or information you are sharing with the viewer. Do not put yourself down because you are not a famous on-camera talent. You are here to do a job and that is to tell your story or convey the information or teach a skill. Find your passion, pride and confidence and speak from that place. You don't need to be perfect. You have to be convincing, confident and welcoming. Next, the single most important technique I can teach you is to visualize one person in the audience you want to speak to and to speak to just that one person. Imagine what this person looks like who is listening to you, what his or her needs and expectations are and deliver. Give them what they want. If your course is aimed at foreign pupils learning English for business, you may want to speak a bit slower, but with the respect you would give to any businessman or woman. If your class is aimed at artistic housewives who are learning to do pottery skills, then your approach will be different because your teaching style will be geared towards the exact market you are trying to reach. Whatever the case may be, speak to just that one person in the group you are visualizing. If you can manage that, then your videos will reflect that you are sincere and connected to the audience. If you are engaging, then the student will be more likely to listen to you and take in the information you are teaching. That's it. That is the single most important technique you should master. It is called visualization. To envision vividly what a person or situation looks like. In the next lesson, I will give you an audio file consisting of a visualization exercise. It is great fun and also relaxing to do while sharpening your mind and assisting with creativity. Now, three more tips I can give you to assist you in being more comfortable in front of the camera. Okay, but I want to get back to empathy. Empathy is the ability to share and imagine the feelings of other people. And we do that through embodiment, through imagining how they are moving, how they are feeling in their bodies. Okay. For the creation of virtual characters, this is super important. We're not going to believe that avatar and connect with it if it doesn't move in a um, convincing way and a human way. And human movement is organic. It's not mechanical. All human movement, all organic movement carries intent, carries motive. There's meaning behind everything we do. There's a motivation for doing everything, either consciously or subconsciously. Um, I would like to demonstrate that, how easy it is to create empathy through nonverbal communication. And for that, I want to ask if I can get two people to put on a mask each and pretend they're ordering coffee at a coffee shop. You're not going to talk, you're just going to stand here. You're going to have two people, you're really you're going to do very little. I want you to do it actually as little as possible, but you are going to order coffee and try to communicate, but you're not going to use words. You're going to have two people. Come on. It's nerd gone. Go, I guess it's excellent. Who else? Otherwise, we're going to pick. Oh, ladies, excellent. Okay. So, ladies, thank you. Can you each choose a mask for yourself? Don't put it on yet. Anyone you want. Okay. All right. So, you two are colleagues. You work at the same place. Um, you've seen each other around, but you don't know each other. Okay. She is highly successful. Okay, like super successful and you would like to get to know her so that you can uh, maybe have her as your mentor or be best friend or somehow just get into her social circle so that you can get uh, up the step up the ladder as well okay so you happen to be at the same coffee shop at the same moment oh how lucky is that um, what you're going to do is you're going to seize this moment to try and talk to her okay but you're a little bit nervous because she's this amazing businesswoman and you, you want some advice you just want to make friends okay you have seen her around and you've heard she's not very good at her job. You don't, <laughs> you don't want to be connected with her, okay? So, but you're very polite, so you're not going to um, completely ignore her. 
Um, so you, you're going to try and show her that you're not really interested in, in making friends and you're going to try and be really eager and, and cool and, and try and, and make a connection. Okay, all non-verbal, the coffee shop is there so you can order anything you like um, and wait for your order to come. Okay, with the mask on. And maybe take a step forward, stand there for us. Thanks. Okay, stop for, me. stop for me. You can take the mask off. Usually, well done, give them a clap. Awesome. Usually I do this twice and, and I say, okay, can you be a little bit more forceful? But you were right in there. I'm like, no, never mind. That's good enough. Excellent. Have a seat. Okay, who did you empathize with? There's no right or wrong. With her? Okay, good. Because sometimes they empathize with, a, with a, I've only had like a, two guys and a guy and a girl, not two, two women. This worked really well. I don't know why women are, are maybe less shy to make a connection. You're like, yeah, so you can, you can empathize with either. Okay? It's a universal language. We are so quick, we can, we can really spot it really quickly and read meaning into it and empathize, put ourselves in that position. Well done, ladies. Thank you. Okay. So far, we've looked at non-verbal communication and we've steered away from facial expression. We've used masks. If you've seen any kind of expression in that mask, you put it there. You uh, um, projected meaning onto that because it's a dead thing. They don't move. Okay, now, I want to move on to facial expression. And for that, I want to talk about a phenomenon called the uncanny valley. The uncanny valley is a an uncanny valley. So if something is uncanny, this is actually where, where the term comes from. Um, it's looking at a computer-generated figure or a humanoid robot that creates a sense of revulsion in the viewer because it looks very much like a human being, but it doesn't act like one. Okay? This is a, for, for creators of characters, uh, this is a tip. Movement always trumps appearance. We will try, and it's amazing why we do this. We will trust the way a thing moves more than the way it looks. Okay? That is what the uncanny valley is about. It's a phenomenon that was discovered by a robotics professor in the 1970s, but it also pertains to CGI characters in movies and video games, and now in virtual characters and assistants that are being created. They use um, virtual characters for trainee doctors, trainee soldiers, and in the recruitment process, where they create these virtual characters that's, that has facial expressions, and the candidate needs to read that facial expression and get a positive outcome, and needs to m do some kind of emotional assessment of the character in front of him. But if those characters aren't uh, expressing real human-like um, facial expressions, then it can have a negative impact for the trainee. So, what these studies found is the regions of interest are the eyes and the mouth. We know we express uh, communication really well with them. But they also found the eyebrow and most recently the forehead. If there's no, no movement here in the forehead, they're like, that thing is dead. This is the uncanny valley coming back. This is amazing. We do need, we communicate with this part of our body. Um, eyebrows, they say it's a form of turn-taking in, con in conversation. I can show you that I, I'm not done talking, you can talk. Or I can show you that um, I understand what you are saying with my eyebrows. With the eyes, obviously eye, con eye contact. Also the direction of eye gaze. If you have an avatar, don't just let the thing move its eyes and look. It needs motivation. Why is it looking that way? Because your viewer is probably going to also look that way. Why are you making him do that? Yeah. There has to be motive behind movement. Eye blink rates. They discovered that 18, 1, 8 blinks per minute is sort of a, a human um, rate of blinking. Anything more than that, and the character can seem erratic or, or a little bit stressed or a little bit too energized, anything less than that, and the character seems wise for some reason. Um, Over exaggerated mouth movements, we go now that thing isn't real. Um, if the voice that is coming from that character doesn't seem to belong to that character, then we also go, I don't believe it, that thing is uncanny valley, it's not real. Okay. Right, facial expression and emotion. I quickly want to do a little exercise, and for this you can just sit in your chairs. I, I'm going to ask you to feel three emotions. 
Okay, I'm going to give you the emotion. You're just going to feel it. And I'm going to count from one to five. And with each count, I want you to imagine, so start low. And then with each count, I want you to feel that emotion a little bit stronger. Okay, so up to five being the strongest. So don't start too high, otherwise you have to go really high. Okay, so your first emotion is boredom. I'm not going to take it personally. I want you to feel really bored. Feel bored, but start low. Feel bored, that's a one. Go up to two, a two, a two, you're a little bit more bored. It's really boring. Go up to a three. I mean, really, why are you here? Why are you back for day two, really? Okay, now look at each other. You do know each other now by now, but share your facial expression. Go up to a four. You're like super bored. This is super boring. Look at that. You're doing it really well. <laughs> Go up to five. <laughs> You're really bored. Oh, I just messed it up. Okay, that's a funny. That's good. Really good, guys. Good. All right, so let's go for the next emotion. And I yesterday was fine, so I hope today will be fine. That no one is paranoid. Let's go for the emotion of suspicion. You're slightly suspicious. Okay, so but start low. But otherwise, you have to go really high. Um, so yeah, very good. Uh, be slightly suspicious. Someone just said something about you. Think you heard your name. You're not sure. Go up to two. You definitely heard your name. Someone is saying something about you. Go up to three. Definitely, they're talking about you in the halls. Share your, your facial expression with your friends. Someone, not, not someone here, but someone is talking about you. <laughs> Four, they are talking about you in the halls. The moment you leave the room, they start talking about you. Share that expression. And five, someone is going to get fired, and it better not be you. Okay, and relax. Okay, last one, a nice emotion. We'll end with... <laughs> are you two talking to each other? Mm. All right, let's start gratitude at a level one. A very basic thing you can be thankful for. I'm thankful for the fact that I'm wearing the same color socks. It's that level gratitude. Just low, start low. Then go up to two, something slightly more important you are grateful for. Go up to three, something even more important that you are grateful for. Share that expression with your friends. Go up to a four, something really important you are grateful for. And go up to a five, the most grateful you can be, something you're really grateful for. <laughs> okay, relax. All right, so this is just an exercise to show you we communicate with our eyes, with our mouth, with the eyebrows and the forehead. We have levels of emotion. You cannot just pack yourself, pat yourself on the back and say, well done, I created this avatar and it's reading happiness. We have levels of happiness. There's a lot of work still to be done. Not just five levels, we have so many levels of emotion. And if we were in a, a more of a workshop space, a little bit more private space, we can share emotions as in, um, I can give you an emotion, you give that emotion to someone else. We can transfer emotions. We do that anyway in the shopping mall, or doctor's office, or, um, waiting room. We sit there and we look at someone and I transfer an emotion to you. We do it naturally. But if we could do that between a human and a virtual character or vice versa, that would be amazing. And we are moving towards that. Okay, um, I want to move on to my last thing, voiceovers. Let's say your material, you don't have any virtual characters, you don't even have video. You have none of this visual stuff that you can use. You only have narration. So lots of copywriters don't have training in writing scripts that are meant to be heard and not read. Okay. As a voiceover artist, I've been doing it for 16 years, and I always find you have to, in a very gentle way, not always, but most of the time, educate the client that they give you copy that's way too long. It's like this five-line paragraph of one sentence. The first tip I can give you is read the copy out loud for yourselves. If you stumble, it means the voiceover artist will probably also stumble over that word. If you need to stop and breathe, chances are the voiceover artist also needs to stop and breathe. So break it up, shorter sentences, punctuate it well. But I'm going to show you a video now. It's, it's great to give us a, a well punctuated script, but we may ignore some of the punctuation sometimes if it's going to flow better. Okay, have a look at this. This is from my course, How to Become a, a Voiceover Artist. And this lesson is about punctuation marks. Hello, I'm Marinda Boeta. I'm a South African voiceover artist and native speaker of Afrikaans. I've been in the voiceover business for well over a decade. And the one thing you always have to deal with is punctuation marks. Now, you may think, punctuation marks? What's that got to do with being a great voiceover artist? With giving the best vocal delivery that you can? Well, 
It's very important. In fact, it's so important that it's a good idea to ignore punctuation marks as much as possible. Copywriters use punctuation marks in scripts that are written for the eye, that are written to be read. Punctuation marks assist in bringing the meaning across in a sentence. But in conversation, we don't use punctuation marks. As human beings, we speak in half sentences. We place pauses in between words when we are lost in thought. We place emphasis on words which we deem to be important, even though there may be no grammatical reason to do so. As a voiceover artist, it's your responsibility to bring the script off the page. And that often means that you must ignore the punctuation marks. So, as a general rule, use punctuation marks as a guidance, but don't take it too literally. Let's have a look at the script for a TV commercial. Right, I want to end this learning lab uh, doing two things. I want to bring your attention back to these two objects, to remembering that we are human beings with a need to communicate with another human being. And we do that via our digital medium, envisioning our human user and coming back to ourselves. It's a human communicating with a human via technology. Okay? That's what I feel we need to come back to with all the fancy stuff that's happening and it's going to escalate and exponentially explode with everything that's going to happen. But we need to keep hold of the humanity and the reason why we want to communicate. Lastly, I want you to, I, I want to do a little visualization exercise with you again. I want you to remember a game you played as a child when you were about four or five years old. Can you remember a game that you played? Think of something, a nice a game that was super fun for you to do, that made you feel great. Okay, now that game had rules. All games have rules. What were the rules of that game? Think about it. Even if you played with a doll, a doll they also have rules. They can only sit on that chair or wear that thing or whatever. Every game had rules. Now can you conjure up the emotion that you want to teach, you are a child, you want to teach that, those rules to another child so that you can play. Because it's important, they have to uh, uh, adhere to the rules. Every game has rules, they have to adhere to rules and that's how we play. Can you conjure up that feeling that you want to teach someone else the rules? Okay, keep hold of that feeling because that is what e-learning can do. I wish for you that we can communicate our content and intent with enthusiasm, sincerity, and the need to give.